But let's just focus on religion for, for a second, and we'll get to the foundations of morality after that. So religion, as you've pointed out, is more than just a set of beliefs. And I, you know, and, and you've argued against me as though I have disputed that, which I actually haven't. But you're, you're not alone in this. Many people do that. So I just want to track through a few of the things you say in your book and then, then talk about them. So, I mean, you say in, in your book, The Righteous Mind, that trying to, this is a quote, trying to understand the persistence and passion of religion by studying beliefs about God is like trying to understand the persistence and passion of college football by studying the movements of the ball. You've got to broaden the inquiry, end quote. So, now, I, I think that analogy is, isn't quite right, but I, but I actually agree with your general point. Religion is, is obviously more than what people believe, and yet I think it's totally coherent and, in fact, necessary to worry about the specific consequences of specific beliefs. And yes. And so, so let me just let me just reform your analogy a little bit and get you to react to it. So, because I think it's somewhat to stick with your analogy, it's a little bit more like asking the question: Why are people on each team always tending to run in one direction? I mean, so if they, if you see them running sideways or even backwards for a few moments, it's always with the purpose to get the ball to the other end of the field. So, so what is so special about the ends of the field that everyone wants to get there? And to explain that, you have to understand the rules of the game. In particular, you have to understand what a touchdown is. And But once you know that, more or less everything these people are doing is easy to understand. And again, there's more to, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's all the people out, you know, having tailgate parties outside the stadium, right? So that's part of the spectacle. But to understand what the most energized participants are doing in this situation, you, all you really need to know is what they want and what they believe will get them what they want. And so I, I would argue that this is true for the most destructive behavior and moral attitudes we see inspired by religion. So you know, when you ask yourself, you know, why is ISIS throwing gay people off of rooftops? It's because their scripture tells them to. It's, it's actually written in the rule book. Now, in this case, it's, it's it, the specific injunctions in the Hadith. It's not in the Quran, but it's part of the larger rule book of Salafi Islam. And I mean, you can say anything you want about religion being more than just beliefs and doctrines, and you can talk about doing and belonging, which you do in addition to belief as being central to religion. And you can talk about the power of ritual and, and strong communities and, and the importance of transcendence, which is something that interests me. And I agree about all these things being interesting, but if you want to explain the behavior of ISIS, all you really have to know are the rules of the game as they understand them. And, and if their rule book changed slightly, if, if they, let's say their rule book on this point said, don't harm homosexuals under any circumstances, simply force them to recite the Quran for 12 hours a day and actually create a special caste of, of priests that, that there's homosexuals who just chant from the Quran and who are otherwise venerated, right? I think we can be absolutely sure that this is what they would be doing. In fact, there are analogous behaviors in other religions in human history. So this is why I think specific doctrines matter. And that no one, I mean, so you're going to talk about the, the intuitive roots of many of these things, but no one has an intuition that they should throw gays off of rooftops specifically, or eat a cracker every Sunday and call it the body of Jesus or oppose embryonic stem cell research. And, and in fact, ISIS wouldn't even oppose embryonic stem cell research, and the Catholic Church would. And this is why the specific doctrines matter so much. Okay. So I, I will certainly grant that specific doctrines matter, and that I think your, your thought experiment is correct. If there was a specific verse, and especially if it appeared in multiple places, that said, here's how you treat homosexuals, uh, you know, then they would treat them differently. So I don't deny that the, the scripture matters. But first, to understand your analogy, you tell me, what is the end zone? What do you think they're all up to? What is the thing they're all striving for to get when you, when you use this end zone analogy? Well, if you're talking about the real players, the real believers who are devoting their lives fully to this, the end zone is paradise and avoiding hell. So it's, it's what happens after death. It's a living by the, playing by this rule book, playing this game, advancing the ball down the field is ensuring that after death you will spend eternity in paradise and escape hell. Okay, so I think this is one of the differences between us, is that I am opposed to the pursuit of parsimony. I think that um, the social science, like human nature and the social science are so complex, and especially if you look at morality or religion. So anytime someone says, the goal of religion ultimately 
is to attain paradise, or the goal of religion ultimately is to have a sense of meaning, or even closer to what I say, if you were to say the goal of religion is ultimately social bonding and connection, well, those are all goals. There are lots of different goals. In this case, I was talking about ISIS. I, mean, I was talking about the what we would call the extreme committed, you know, death cult of Islam. Now, there's a, analogous cults in in you know, other traditions, but I'm not saying that all religious people in every denomination of every level of commitment that their main goal is paradise. Some, you know, some you know Unitarians don't necessarily even believe in heaven, right? So. I was speaking about ISIS in this case. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so I can certainly grant your point that beliefs do matter and I hope I never said they that they don't or uh, um and uh but I think I would still uh, I would still claim that your analysis here is 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 too focused on the explicit. And so and this was you know my main criticism my main concern about your writings on religion was I felt like sometimes felt like you were writing you know your two religion books I felt like you were writing those mostly with the Bible and the Quran and the New York Times on your desk and and you were sort of saying okay well look at this verse or look at this event that happened um, and then just trying to make sense of it yourself and I was thinking of it much more both from a kind of a Durkheimian point of view or a, you know, unconscious modus point of view. I mean, there's just so much going on here. And I have not studied ISIS. I don't know what's going on with them. Um, but I don't believe you could understand them by just by reading the Quran and saying, oh, the Quran says this. That This is why ISIS is doing it. Well, the, there, thing the is, motives of humiliation, geopolitical. Con- I mean, I don't know what's going on, but uh, uh, there's a lot going on. But this is, I mean, the issue is that this is how they understand themselves. And now here I'm not just speaking about ISIS. I'm just speaking about religious fundamentalists in general. When you ask them how they understand what they're doing, if you ask them why homosexuality is anathema, for instance, they have a scriptural justification for it, and it does explain the belief and subsequent behavior, and where, where in certain cases, nothing else does. I mean, so I, you, we might, it might be relatively easy to come up with other non-scriptural reasons to be uncomfortable around the, the phenomenon of homosexuality, and, and we can talk about that. I mean, this kind of gets into your kind of moral intuitions, the moral foundations theory, but for many of these things, the only way this idea could ever get into someone's head is based on the tradition and the explicit teaching on a specific point. Ag- agreed. I, I agree with you on that point. And so let's make a distinction that I think will be very helpful here, which is between fundamentalism and religion more generally. So if we're talking about fundamentalist movements, then you and I are going to agree much more, including in the moral evaluation of them. Um, and so the if we live in a in a diverse society, if we live in a society or if, you know, if, if we value progress and uh, open debate of ideas and challenging each other and, and the things we need for the sciences, then fundamentalism is incompatible with all of those things. Christian fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, I would say politically correct fundamentalism or social justice fundamentalism. Uh, I think you and I both personally dislike uh, fundamentalist, the fundamentalist mindset, I should say. I don't mean the, the people. I mean the, the fundamentalist mindset mm. is, is opposed to values that you and I both hold as individuals and for, and for science. Um, so there I think there's not as much disagreement between us. But then if you say, what about non-fundamentalist? That's where I think you're much more negative than I am about people who are religious but not fundamentalist. Is that true? Well, yeah, I, I'm more negative in the sense that I feel like they make one honest talk about the problem of fundamentalism much more difficult because they they don't want anything too critical said about their holy books or about a tradition of of venerating the the concept of revelation right I, I think we're I think revelation is a problem here the idea that one of our books was not the product of the human mind but the product of omniscience that already just deranges our intellectual and moral discourse really beyond s- saving and and we have to we have to get out of that that part of the religion business and so that insofar as moderates and liberals do well then th- my only real concern is that well there's i guess there are two more concerns one is they tend to not be intellectually honest about the process uh, whereby they have become moderate or liberal so they s- pretend that there's something in the tradition in the books that has has been self-purifying but no when you go back to the books they're every bit as theocratic as they always were uh, what's happened is that, is that they have collided with a wider set of values secular values and scientific insights and progress and they have found being doctrinaire and, and dogmatic is no longer how they want to live they can no longer justify it but they're not really honest about just how that winnowing has taken place and 
and they they tend to give credit to the the resources of the tradition, whereas really it's the resources of a much larger conversation that human beings have had. Sure. So if you if you want to say that people are adopting positions and then searching for a justification and looking for some sort of textual justification for what they've decided to do intuitively, yep, I'm down with that. That's that's the the core of my research is that that's what a lot of our uh, moral argument and justification is all about. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so you do one. I just want to go back to your book briefly. You do one thing in your book, which I it's pretty clearly an area where we disagree. I don't think we need to go into it any real depth because it it may be a little hard to parse here in in a podcast. But I think we should just flag it because it, it is one. I think it's also one reason why you think I and Richard Dawkins and and others have been too hard on religion, and, and it's this notion that religion has provided an evolutionary benefit to us. Is it an adaptation or a byproduct? You're right. That is the other core factual or scientific issue that we disagree on. Right. So I just want to introduce this this concept of group selection to those who don't know anything about it, and then we can table it probably. But So you defend this notion of, of group selection, and specifically the idea that, that religion has helped certain groups survive, and perhaps a lack of religion has caused others to fail. And you think that this mechanism hasn't just been cultural, but that it's also been biological. And, and so this, this idea of, of group selection, which obviously relates to much more than just religion, this is very controversial in biology. And, and you know, its main champion, who you do side with here, is someone named David Sloan Wilson, who, interestingly, he's also attacked the new atheists with a, a level of energy that I never quite understood. So I should just point out that there are many biologists, and I would think still most, as far as I can take the temperature on the whole field, disagree with, with this idea of group selection. And so if our listeners are interested in it, I, I think the best summary of the reasons to doubt that group selection occurs was written by, by our mutual friend Steven Pinker, and the title is The False Allure of Group Selection, and that can be found on edge.org. I know you must be aware of that mm-hmm. paper. So, oh, yeah. So no, you, I, I responded to it. So, so you weren't persuaded by it. So, yeah. So that is what the debate comes down to, um, is if, you know, is religion a product of evolution? Is it an adaptation? In which case, that doesn't mean it's still adaptive today, but it would mean that it conferred some benefit. Um, the, the really exciting idea that so captivated me when I first read Dawkins in college was, wow, what if it's like a virus? What if there, it, it's just, it's taken advantage of the, of the hardware up there and it's exploiting it for its purposes. And of course, Dawkins and, and Dennett are, exp- are, you know, are really explicit about that. It's a really cool idea and I used to believe it. And that was the prevailing wisdom. You know, Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, was an incredibly powerful book and a, a testament to the power of good writing uh, to be persuasive. So the state of the art in the 70s and 80s was, as you say, that most biologists uh, doubted it. In fact, almost all did. Group selection was dismissed because there wasn't any way to solve the free rider problem. If groups were to cooperate for the benefit of the group, any free rider within the group would get extra benefit and the genes for free riding would spread. Um, And so the topic was put aside and David Sloan Wilson was seen as a lone crazy. But a lot has changed since then. So right around that time, the whole idea of major transitions in evolution was being formulated. Um, And there are many other examples of of uh, agents that were functioning at an individual level, competing with each other, coming together uh, to be more effective as a group. And even the cells in our body are an example of that. The mitochondria have their own DNA uh, because it was an example of a major transition where multiple entities got together uh, to act as a group. Um, let's see, what else was there? There's, um, I go through in my book, I go through mm-hmm. as though there were four uh, exi- for new exhibits, four reasons to re-examine the case since the 1970s, um, gene culture of coevolution, things like that. And while it is still true that um, their uh, their biologists mostly seem to side against this, this is actually because I think E. O. Wilson made a big mistake in writing a paper. I, I love him. I think he's mostly right about things, but I think he made a big mistake in writing a paper saying that kin selection doesn't matter. And I don't understand, I don't make, think that makes any sense. Kin selection is really powerful. So mm-hmm. he took a lot of flack, and people are conflating um, his rejection of kin selection with his endorsement of groups, or I should say multi-level selection. Um, so just the final point on this is the whole debate since, since the 60s um, with Williams and then Dawkins was always looking at altruism. Can we explain altruism? as a product of group selection. We are nice to each other uh, because the benefits then to the group 
uh, outweigh the cost to me as an individual. And my and, and so and my response to Steve Pinker was, well, if you just focus on being nice or altruistic, well, then yeah, it, it's kind of hard to argue that this is from group selection. But if you look at the tribalism, that's what really got me. That's why I'm on this side of the debate. If you look at tribalism, how similar it is, how initiation rites all over the world are actually mimicked in in fraternity brothers initiations. I don't think it's because they studied anthropology. It's because there's something in the human mind that makes people, especially young men, want to do things that involve painting their faces or changing their appearance, exposing each other to extreme risk, doing all sorts of things that bond them together as a group, make them quite dangerous, quite able to be predators of other groups. Mm -hmm. So I think you and I agree on those external costs. So anyway, that's why I'm saying that if you focus on tribalism, you try to understand that, I don't see how you can explain that from individual selection. And this is why I think that the arguments for group sele- limited group selection were overwhelmed, as I, that's why I say we're 90% chimp, were overwhelmingly evolved by individual level selection as the, of, in the way that Dawkins describes it. But we have this interesting tribal overlay, and I think that's essential for understanding not just morality and religion, but politics, as we're going to talk about very soon. Right, right. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't say just a couple of words about why group selection seems spooky from a more traditional evolutionary point of view, and and, and then I'll I'll just get off it because I I don't think we'll resolve it here. But I just think you know from the point of the criticism, it's just, it seems to be a metaphor that gets taken too literally and that blurs the lines between genes and individuals and groups as units of selection. So so you know as you said, group selection is often called multi level selection. Yeah, that's the way to think about it. Right. But you know, as Steve and others have pointed out that there there are many problems with saying that selection acts on groups in the same way that it acts on individuals to maximize their inclusive fitness, or that it acts on them in the same way that it acts on genes, increasing numbers of copies that appear in the next in the next generation. So there's, if there's a these things are operating differently, and and I just. And again, my, I'm dogged by the fact that I feel like this is a little too hard to parse in a podcast for people to listen. So we can, right, we can skip it. We can just point people. Um, actually, I think you know what chapter nine of my book. Um, so let's do this. I have made chapter nine of the Righteous Mind available for free on my webpage. So if people go to righteousmind.com, um, they can find my argument for group selection. And if they uh, Google, well, I guess you can direct them to the. But if they basically just Google Edge Pinker. What false allure of group selection? Yeah, is that what the, yeah, that's yeah, Steve's. They article. can find that. So that's Steve. Steve makes a strong argument against it. So th- I think we can just pass it off in that way. Yeah, I mean, so it just just to crib Steve briefly, the 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 issue is that there's a lot of causality in the world that you don't need natural selection to explain, and so so merely having one tribe outcompete another doesn't require natural selection. So like, for instance, if, if the if the Nazis had won the war, right, and we were now living in the first century of the Thousand Year Reich, this wouldn't be an example of group selection. I mean, and the difference that would make a difference here is, is almost certainly cultural and not genetic. So if the Germans had won the war, sequencing Hitler's genome wouldn't tell us why. And yet we would still be living in a world where everyone would now be a Nazi and the Nazis have have succeeded. But here again, so when in talking about success, the success of a group, in this case, the Nazis, we're using a metaphor here because this is not analogous to the success we talk about when we talk about genes spreading in a population. Because you know, the, the, in here, in this case, this, the, the, the success itself applies to the group, the Nazi party, enduring for centuries, not to some entity at the end, end of generations of replicators that have been copying themselves with some rate of mutation and then outcompeting all others. So Steve argues, I think, very strongly that it's a confusion over a metaphor. The interesting thing for me, though, is with group selection, I think it's yeah, actually I thought, a. I it's, we're it, leaving it. No, no, we are. No, we are. But it's actually a red herring for me because you know I'm happy to assume it's true for the sake of argument, right? And it won't actually change any of the things you and I disagree about in this space because it seems to me that you draw normative claims from the fact that group selection is a fact and Indire- it, very indirectly. Yes, you seem to be saying that even if the tenets of religion are false. Right, group selection proves that religion is has still been a kind of necessary social glue. And well, hold on. Can I wait? Wait. Let me reword that. So I think. Look, you and I are both atheists. We're both naturalists. We both believe that religion is out there in the world. Uh, uh, it's part of human nature in some way, shape, or form, and that evolution has to do with the explanation for why it why it's out there. So we're both naturalists. The question at hand is whether it does something or confers some benefit 
such that if we could rip it out, we would lose nothing or mm. something. And on Dawkins' view, and I think your view, if we could just get rid of it entirely, we'd be better off. And that might be true, I don't know. But if, um, if religion is an adaptation, as I believe it is, uh, then it could still be true that it was necessary for getting us to where we are. And I do believe that religion and the psychology of religion helps explain how we and only we made the transition um, to living in large-scale societies of non-kin. It could still be the case that it was useful back in tribal days, and now we've supplanted it with mm. law and other things. So I, I would never say that uh, religion being an adaptation or the truth of multilevel selection would prove anything about how we ought to live today. But... What I do draw from it is that seeing it as an adaptation for group solidarity and group coherence makes it easier to see some of the psychological benefits and socio-structural benefits that might be there that are hard to see if you're a secular person on the left. Because that is what I see, is it's really hard to understand what's good about the other side once you're in a, a, an argument or debate with them. And from reading scholarship on religion, from reading books, especially the book, um, James Alt has this wonderful book, Spirit and Flesh, that really helps you see the sociology of a small evangelical community. Community. So that, that's my only point. I, I wouldn't say I draw normative implications directly, but I do draw implications for what kinds of lives are happy and satisfying, what kinds of social patterns and structures make people less selfish and more inclined to think about others. And, and there, I think it, it, you just have to think twice if you're going to say religion's just bad and it makes people do bad things, get rid of it. Yeah, well, so I, I, obviously I share your concern for human flourishing and us getting in a position to tune all the dials to maximize it. I guess I was detecting in you some version of the naturalistic fallacy, some version of, of saying that because this thing is natural to us and in fact selected for and did our ancestors good, that is, is some argument, some weight on the balance to argue that it is in fact good morally speaking. Oh, no, and, no. And I was only, I'm only making the argument actually in a way that very much the way, like the way you make in the moral landscape. Um, if we're going to talk about human flourishing, we need a full picture of, of yeah. human psychology, just straight descriptively. So I think you and I differ a little in our descriptive picture of human psychology. But beyond that, it's a pretty much a straight, flourishing, right. happiness uh, explanation. So I, don't, I see what you're saying, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not making the naturalistic fallacy by saying, if it's evolved, therefore it's right or good. I'm not saying that. Right. So, so it's just, if it's evolved, you're, you would suggest that it could be harder to get rid of if bad, because we're, we've all evolved to think in these ways. But one distinction I, I still think in this area that divides us, at least it changes the way we tend to talk about this, is there is a distinction in thinking about how science can touch this subject. And the distinction between how we got here, the, the, the evolutionary story of just how we came to have the brains and mental capacities we have, and then there's the question of just what is possible given what we are. And that's, for me, that is a, those are two distinct and totally interesting and justifiable projects, but they're distinct and science has a very different role to play in each. And if, so if you're just going to do descriptive science and talk about how we got here, yes, that has no necessary normative implications. And many people stop there and say, well, so science can't tell you how to live. Science can just tell you why it is you find certain things disgusting, why we've, you know, evolved to have very strong in-group, out-group thinking. But, you know, we did not evolve to successfully build a global civil society that's committed to human rights and the free exchange of ideas and racial and gender equality, right? So the question is, can we accomplish this? And, you know, and I, I think we can. But the further question is, you know, would it be moral to accomplish it? And would it be a bad thing if we failed? And I think, yes, it, we, we can answer yes on both of those questions. And the crucial point, though, is that success on this front will entail overcoming a fair amount of what we've evolved to care about. So you cite a bunch of work, I remember Putnam and Campbell being some of it, that seems to show that religion is good for people. So in this case, it makes them more generous. Yes, in the United States, that's right. Okay. It doesn't say globally, but yes, in the United States, there's a lot of evidence that religion makes people happier and better citizens, according to Putnam and Campbell. That's right. And, and this is the result of their belongingness to a, a religious community, not, not their beliefs and, and doctrines. That's exactly right. And this increased generosity isn't just lavished on their in-group, it actually extends to the rest of society, which would surprise many atheists. Now, I don't actually know whether or not this is true, let's just assume it is all true. It seems to me that even if we accept that as true, 
it obviously isn't the whole story. I mean, I think we could design a dozen invidious experiments where we show that religious people are more homophobic, say, or sexist than secular people on average, or have a, le a lesser understanding of science or less respect for science. And this is, I mean, it's a, this, this would help complete the picture. But I think the problem I have with this line of thinking is that there seems to be a, a, a tacit assumption that if we can show that, that religion is doing something good for people, there is no better way to get those goods that's compatible with a truly rational worldview. That's a fine point. I, okay. agree, with, with, I agree with that. But, let, but let's see. I think, but you raised, you raised a question that I think would be great for us to try to work out here. I think we'll, we might come to different views. So you said, and I think we both agree, that our evolved human nature did not prepare us to live in a giant, global, peaceful, egalitarian society under rule of law. Where in a sense, we're living above our design constraints. And clearly, to some extent, it's possible because despite the imperfections, we're sort of doing it nowadays. So our evolutionary past, while it makes, it puts on some constraints, they're kind of loose constraints, and we can live in all kinds of ways that we weren't designed for. But here's where, here's where I think our different views of religion would lead to different prescriptions for how to do that. So I take part in a lot of discussions. I'm invited to all sorts of, of sort of, you know, lefty uh, meetings about a global society. And, and you know, the left usually wants... Um, they want a glo that global governance. They want more power vest in the UN. They, I, I hear a lot of uh, talk on the left about how countries or national borders are bad things. They're arbitrary. So the left tends to want hmm. more of a universal. I mean, just think about the John Lennon song. This is you know what I always go back to. Just think about imagine. Imagine there's no religion, no countries, no private property, nothing to kill or die for. Then it would all be peace and harmony. So that is a sort of a far leftist view of what the end state of human evolution or social evolution could be. Now, is that is that possible or is it is it consistent with our evolved nature? Now, here's the other side. The other side, the conservative view, is that we are fundamentally groupish, more parochial creatures and um, to have global governance and a, glo a bit, one giant country or one giant community of, the, of all Earth would be a nightmare. The, um, it would be chaos. It just wouldn't work. Far better to have authority at the lowest level possible at all times um, and, and build up with nested structures. So a country ends up, for conservatives, a country ends up being a very reasonable, uh, basic building block, and they would not want as much of a global society. They certainly would want international law, they would want treaties, they'd want all sorts of things. So I think this is a case where if you, if you have a kind of a blank slate view or a very positive view that our basic nature is love and cooperation and it's only capitalism that screwed it up, you're going to want a kind of a John Lennon vision of the future. And I don't think that that could really work. Hmm. Whereas if you start with Edmund Burke, who talks about the little platoons of society, we, start, we, we develop in the family. So conservatives are really, really focused on the family and lower level institutions. And if you focus on making those strong, and then you think about some sort of a legal and social architecture that allows multiple families and communities and states and countries to work together with a minimum of friction, I think that's much more workable. So getting a, getting a correct view of our evolutionary heritage and the psychology that resulted from it, um, I think is very helpful. It doesn't tell us what's right or wrong, but I think it does tell us which way is more likely to work. Uh, and if you, if you see us as products of multi-level selection uh, with a deep, deep tribalism, that suggests that you're probably better off going for more the Burke way and having groups that are composed of groups and, and finding ways for them to work together rather than the John Lennon way, which is let's erase all group boundaries. Let's erase uh, divisions of nation and everything else and just have one giant planet. Uh, I, you know, I just don't think that's likely to work. I, I think that is like as with the communist societies, it's making assumptions about human nature uh, that end up, you know, people just refuse to live that way and it's a disaster. One thing about what you said that I want to pull back to the, the focus on religion is just that you're essentially exposing some of the holes in secular thinking. And I, I agree those holes are there. In fact, I've written two books that attempt to, to shore up some of the, the weaknesses I, I, I see in secularism. And what you just said relates to this very topical example of the recent migrant crisis in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Where you have you know, secular liberals, for the most part, and you know, atheists who really can't find a 
rationale, morally speaking, for anything less than an open borders policy. And in fact, so there's, there's two reasons here, there's two connections here, because there's this low birth rate in Europe, and many people attribute that to secularism. The, the, the loss of religion is, is, is really leading to a loss of babies, and that, that becomes a, a justification for bringing in immigrants because they need people to, to work in these societies. So, so one could argue that for two reasons, both economically and morally, secularists are now in a position, you know, someone like Angela Merkel, where they're unable to find a reason to keep the borders closed. And let's just say that this happens, where you have millions upon millions of Muslims who on balance are deeply religious and disposed to have large families. They flood into Europe over the next few decades. And in a hundred years, Europe is predominantly Muslim and deeply religious, right? This is a possible counterfactual or actual history. So what lesson should we draw from this? Many people would conclude that what Europeans needed in the year 2016 is more Christianity, right? That that only a belief in Jesus and, and the associated behavior and belongingness that that confers and the fertility rates that get associated with a taboo around contraception, that only that could have protected them from the sweeping changes in their society. And, and I would just argue is that there must be a truly rational way for secular people just to figure out what sort of world they want to live in and simply build it. Yep, I totally agree, Sam. And I think this is a nice example for us to talk about because I think you and I both are wary of, of um, mass, mass immigration, but maybe for different reasons. Um, so, so first of all, the drop in birth rate, uh, apparently the Scandinavians that, who give a lot of support for women working have at least, you know, they're still below two per woman, but it's not as disastrous as in southern Italy where they don't. So hmm. you can have a secular society that, if you engineer it right, can still have birth rates that are not much below two, perhaps. So I don't think, I wouldn't say that, oh, Europe needs more Christianity in order to have more babies. Um, but I think they, you know, you, the demographic issue is is really important for the future of, of any viable society. But um, I am a Durkheimian. Uh, I think Emil Durkheim got it right. I think you have to see communities as absolutely needing a sense of cohesion, trust, shared values, a sense of who we are. Mm. And this is why mass immigration uh, is, can be a bad thing. Now, uh, I'm Jewish. My grandparents came to America in around 1905, 1907, fleeing pogroms. So I look at the videos, I see the kids coming out of Syria, and boy, it's the same thing. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the moral case. Um, But as a Durkheimian, I think that you can have immigration if you have massive assimilation, which is what my grandparents, or more correctly, my parents then went through. So if you have a society that has the moral resources to say, this is America, welcome, adapt, learn Mm -hmm. English, you get get free education, but you're going to be an American, then you can have mass immigration. Um, And it clearly boosted our creativity, our economy. So, you know, there are many good things about immigration. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, you know, immigration is bad. I'm saying there are many good things about it. But from a Durkheimian perspective, um, especially Muslim immigration, which is, I think, different from, say, uh, the Mexican immigration that we have. There's no reason to think that that Mexicans won't adapt, Mexican immigrants, uh, that their kids won't adapt. Uh, But Islam is, is different. It is more, it's more of a binding belief. So to have massive Muslim immigration into secular European societies, where not only do you not have assimilation, you have the left arguing, I don't know if they say the same thing there as they say here, that you know assimilation is genocide, mm. which is ridiculous. But if you have an anti-assimilationist ethos, then I think Europe is setting itself up for massive failure. Um, their generous redistributionist welfare states can only work if people have a strong sense of social solidarity. And if you have diversity, diversity is divisive. Again, this is Robert Putnam. He has a wonderful paper called E Pluribus Unum uh, Mm. on how diversity is divisive. So I think Europe is in huge, huge trouble because it's very hard to make, you know, given the moral case for mass immigration, they're going to have it. But the sociology is kind of worrisome for what Europe's going to be like, uh, for what these European countries that have high immigration, it's going to be like in in one or two generations. Yeah, yeah. Well, we fully agree on that topic. And I have actually talked the immigration topic to death on my podcast of late. So let's move to morality proper, because this is really where you've made your biggest mark. And it's an area where you and I both agree and disagree. So as you've already said, you're very skeptical about the power of moral reasoning. And you, you don't say that we never change our attitude or the attitudes of others through reason, but you insist that we do this far less often than we think or than anyone hopes. 
you also claim that you claim that most of our seemingly rational talk about morality isn't what it appears to be because we reason like lawyers and re- not really like moral philosophers. So most of our reasoning, and by lawyers you mean that most of our reasoning is is really in the service of justifying moral attitudes that we arrived at intuitively. And so we're we're simply in the business of defending and and marketing these intuitions, you know, and, and just and not fundamentally getting down to some kind of ethical bedrock. And you you move from these observations about the intuitive roots of our moral attitudes and the resulting diversity of opinion morally among people to conclude that science really can't hope to talk in terms of moral truth. First, have I summarized that basic skepticism accurately? Yes. I would only add that my skepticism is not about reason in general. It's about individual reason, the power of an individual to reason. If you set systems up correctly, and this is what's so brilliant about science, if you set systems up correctly so that you have institutionalized disconfirmation so that each scientist who's totally motivated to prove himself right goes out there and and, uh, proves himself right, but then you have others to push back and this is a reasoned process. We, you know, we really do make our points not by threat, not by force, not by money. We make them by making arguments. And over time, the system sorts out the better from the worse. So if you think about reason as an emergent property of a system that's set up well, then I'm a big fan of reason. And this is why I'm so upset about the loss of political diversity in the academy. And I guess we'll get to that next. Yeah. But this is one of the reasons why the academy has just exploded in craziness, is that it used to simply lean left, and now it's almost 100% left. Right. But anyway, we'll get to that in a moment. But yeah, as for, as for morality... Yes, I I think that the basic psychology that we're what we're finding in social and cognitive psychology is motivated reasoning, um, and we're just not that good at weighing the evidence on both sides. Rather, what we're really good at is we start with a proposition and we ask, "Must I believe it? Am I forced to believe it? If you don't want to believe it, and then we look for evidence that it's wrong." Or more typically, you start with a proposition you want to believe it. You search for evidence that it's right. You almost always can find it, and then you stop thinking. So that's why I'm not a big fan of individual reasoning. I think we're kind of like neurons. We're not that smart as individuals, but you put us together in the right way, you get a brain. Right. But you seem to hold the things we can be right or wrong about in the moral sphere as different from the facts that science treats. Correct. Right. That's, so right. That's an, another fundamental distinction between us. Yes. Yeah. So just introduce this concept of, of moral dumbfounding for a second. So one of the first, one of the, uh, uh, so I, w- when I started uh, my research in graduate school at Penn and then as an assistant professor at the University of Virginia, originally I thought that reasoning and emotion were both inputs into moral judgment and either one could dominate. That's kind of a dual process model. And, and mm-hmm. Josh Green ha- is the main proponent of such a model. But I, I, I kept failing to find that reasoning would work as, as I expected it to. And I kept finding that sort of the people's gut feelings tended to drive the reasoning. And so I would, I would make up these stories that would pit reasoning uh, about harm versus gut feelings. And so one of the stories was about a brother and sister who are on vacation, coll- from summer vacation from college. They're traveling alone together in France. They, they're staying in a cabin by the beach. They decide one night it would be interesting and fun if they tried making love. They use two forms of birth control just to be sure. They enjoy it, but they decide not to do it again. They keep that night as a special secret between them, which makes them feel even closer. What do you think about this? Is that okay for them to do it? And almost every Everybody says no, and then the experimenter would say, okay, well, why? Tell me why. And at that point, everybody comes up with a reason. Nobody says, well, gosh, I don't know. I can't explain it. Everyone comes up with a reason. Uh, but the experimenter would say, well, okay, yeah, you know, true, birth defects, that, you know, that's a good reason. But, you know, if they're, if they're using birth control, like if they could be sure that there's no baby to come, then is it okay? And nobody would say, oh, yeah, sure, if there's no baby, then it's okay. Rather, if you knock down the reason, they say, oh, okay, yeah, well, let me see, let me see. Uh, okay, oh, how about this? Yeah, yeah. And they come up with a second reason. You mm-hmm. knock that down. And after you do this a few times, then eventually people say, gosh, I don't know. I, I can't explain it. I just I just feel it's wrong, and I don't, I don't know. I can't explain it. So that's moral dumbfounding. And that I took as evidence that gut feelings can support a moral judgment, even in the absence of any articulable reason. Right. Right. But what I always read you as suggesting there, and, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you move from that fact to suggest that there clearly can be no truth of the matter, right? The fact that people will hold... Wait, wait, wait. No, I don't think I ever do that. I would not say that moral dumb, the, the existence of moral dumbfounding tells us nothing about whether or not there's moral truth. You and okay. I disagree about moral truth, but that's unrelated to dumbfounding. That's more of a philosophical argument about the different kinds of things that are true. 
Well, that that's an implication uh, I wouldn't want you to draw, and if you don't draw it, that's great. Let's talk about you know. I mean, I, I I'm so, very fond of this term, uh, anthropocentric versus non-anthropocentric truth. Should we, right. should we talk about that? Well, let, let me just connect it to another term that people are aware of: moral relativism. Would you consider yourself a moral relativist? No, but I'm also not a moral realist. So no, I'm not a moral relativist. I think there are moral truths, but they are not the same as the truths of chemistry and physics. So, and just to get everyone up to speed on what we just said, this idea, the idea of moral relativism is, I, you know, the, this can mean many different things, and it's a little confusing. I mean, in some ways, even my own view can be called a version of moral relativism, because I believe that there are multiple distinct and yet incompatible possible good lives that people could live, or, or good societies that could be built. In my book, The Moral Landscape, I say that there are potentially many and even in a potentially infinite number of peaks on the moral landscape. Yep, there, I, I like that metaphor and agree with that argument, yes. But that, that doesn't undercut the, the reality of moral truth, because there are many ways to be off a peak and down in a valley that is purely a, a, an area of misery. So the fact that there are many right answers to a question doesn't mean there, there isn't a difference between a right and wrong answer. But the phrase moral relativism is more usually applied to people who think that just to speak in terms of moral truth is to engage in, in one or another species of, of fallacious thinking, that there are no truths that, that are really true in the sense that things can be scientifically or historically or economically true. And I now, I, I now recall that your, one of your mentors was or is Richard Schwader, the anthropologist, is, and I've actually collided with him both in private and in, in print briefly on this topic, and he always struck me as, as a relativist of the latter type. Is that true? And I mean, do you have a difference in your orientation? You know, Rick is so smart and subtle that almost any category you want to put him in, if you ask him if he fits in it, he'll, you won't get a yes or no answer, or the answer will be no. So I don't, I, you know, I can see why you'd call him a relativist. He's some sort, he, he, he considers himself a pluralist, and, and, uh, and I do too. I consider myself and him a pluralist, and I, I was very influenced by him on that. So actually, can I... Can I, can I please introduce yes, this concept? Because I think this really clarifies everything for me. Because, you know, so philosophers have gone round and round about relativism and realism for a long time. And while I was working with Rick Schwader, uh, as, when I was a postdoc at the University of Chicago, the first thing he had me read just about was a, uh, an essay by the philosopher David Wiggins, um, which completely changed my thinking about this, and I've never fa had a reason to, to change it since then. Um, Wiggins simply introduces this distinction between different kinds of facts. There are anthropocentric facts, which are true only because of the kinds of creatures we are, and there are non-anthropocentric facts, which are true regardless of the kinds of creatures we are, regardless of whether we ever evolved or existed. Mm. So the Earth is the third planet from the sun. If aliens come here, they'll find that. Uh, copper is a better conductor of electricity than aluminum. It doesn't matter if, they, if we never invented electricity. That is still true. So the kind of truths that you talk about in the moral landscape, you're mostly focused on the truths of the natural sciences. We all agree those are true. Those are true facts. They're true regardless of human participation in them. And the question is, are moral facts the same kinds of facts as those. You say yes, I say no. But that doesn't make me a relativist because there are many other kinds of facts. So um, uh, the, 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 my, the clearest case for me is facts that emerge because of our interactions with each other. So if I say to you that silver is more valuable than gold, now I'm perfectly free to say I like silver more than gold, but that's not a claim about a fact. But I'm going to tell you right now, Sam, gold is more valuable than silver. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. Now, that's not a fact of the natural sciences. It's not true in other planets. It's, a, it's an emergent fact because we interact with each other in certain ways. Well, it's also it's socially constructed. Yes. Mm, no, it's, no, no, no. Social construction means um, that we, we attach certain meanings to it, like, you know, cancer is a mark of moral depravity or something. You know, people have thought that was a social construction. This is an emergent truth. And emergent truths can be true even if people don't even know that they're true. So markets can yield prices and uh, prices can move even if people aren't really aware of the movements of the prices. Well, yeah, but that, but that's true. But markets are still social construction. I mean, so like money is a social construct. That's right. So market, right, true. Markets are human creations. But as markets interact, they generate economic facts. Let's take a more challenging one. Should women have equal political rights? Um, you, we all say yes. Now, is that a fact, a fact true across species that any intelligent creatures, if they have sexual divergence on a different planet, 
they'll it'll be true for them is it true is it a fact such that even if we go back 10,000 years ago in which women almost never had equal political power they were all wrong all human societies were wrong 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 until the 1960s this is a more challenging case but i would argue this um given the way we live now where the basic unit of politics is the individual, there is no good reason, and it would be uh, unethical to deny women equal political access and political participation. But for thousands of years, people didn't live that way. People lived in which, let's just say in many societies, the family was the basic unit, and there was a division of labor, the man was the political actor, the woman handled uh, more the domestic sphere, and gathering while the man did hunting. So if you just accept that that's the way hunter-gatherers lived, now, can you say that it is a fact that women should have had equal political power. They should have been president at all the political. They were just wrong that they denied that. So I don't think that makes any sense. I think that women's equality is an emergent fact about the way we live now. It is not a fact like like chemistry, like you know, like 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 copper being a good conductor. What do you think? Do you think women's equality is a fact like the superior conductivity of copper? Well, well, not quite. It's certainly a more complicated fact. But here's why I think this this bright line between anthropocentric and other truths doesn't get you very far. Because one, my interest in morality extends beyond what is even human. I'm talking about what possible minds there are in this universe. I mean, just what what sorts of experiences are there to have given just the nature of consciousness and how it arises in a universe. So if we wind up building conscious computers that can suffer, how can they suffer and how wrong would it be to build those things? If we can change our brains in the future in such a way as to give ourselves different moral intuitions, right? So not only to live more faithfully by the intuitions we have, but to then ask the question, what intuitions should we have? right? If we could change ourselves into a species of perfectly matched masochists and sadists, would it be wrong to do so? I think those are coherent questions, but they kind of fly the boundaries that you're setting for anthropocentric and other truth claims. And I, I, so for me, it's, it's really, a, you know, I view it as a the strong claim I want to make about moral truth and its connection to science, and again, science in the most open-ended way. I mean, the science we will be talking about 10,000 years from now, whatever we are, if we're around to talk about anything. The connection is, I mean, you can, you can even forget about the word morality, forget that we have have this term, forget that we've evolved to the point we have, and just ask yourself, what possible experiences are there in this universe? And that just faces us with a navigation problem. We have, we're, we're at our starting point, wherever we are now or in the future. And if we move one way, we'll become re- both individually and collectively reliably more miserable, right? And more, and, and you, if you move far enough in that direction, you can right, become yeah. so miserable that there's just no redeeming yeah. Ceter- quality at Ceteris all. Paribus. Yeah. If, if you keep everything else constant, more misery is worse than less misery. I'm, I'm with you on that. Right. And then who knows how good human life or beyond human life can be given perfect cooperation creativity of a sort we can't even currently imagine, technology that has no downside, free energy, you know, everything is powered by starlight and we just are living in some perfect condition that we may in fact never attain given our, you know, humble apish origins, but is in fact possible for minds differently constituted than our own, right? So we're living in that space and we're, we're navigating in that space of, of possibility. And then so when you ask a question like, well, should women be given the vote or should they, be, should they live as equals to men politically, then I think that, yes, the moral landscape allows for two, very likely allows for incompatible, but possibly equally flourishing conditions where in some societies, women, for whatever reason, decide they don't really care about politics and they just want to be the best moms possible. And they have made that choice for reasons in this counterfactual history that are slightly different than our own. And, you know, I could imagine some condition still of flourishing there that is every bit as good as the one we are attempting to navigate toward. But given where we are and given our history, I would agree with you that obviously having women be the political equals of men is the right thing. And everyone else in our current world committed to some other project there is obviously doing it for reasons that are that are rationally and, and ethically indefensible. And 
creating some rather, again, I'm happy to use you know, these certainty terms, creating rather obvious harms in their own societies, both to the boys and the girls and the, and the women and the men. And you know, the, the ultimate case being Afghanistan under the Taliban or you know, the Islamic State now. I mean, if, you, if you look at what life for women and girls is there, it's There's it's a level horrible. of brut- brutality and exploitation. I, you know, a, a society ravaged by war tends not to be one uh, in which you find much humanity. And so the way that women are treated, uh, the, the, uh, so no, I'm, I'm with you on, 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 on seeing those, kind, those societies and the lives for women and men as, as horrific. The, but the thing I, wanna, I want to check with you is you talked about um, consciousness wherever it is. Suppose that there was intelligent life on another planet, we make contact with it. All we know is that it is conscious and it is intelligent. Are you saying that we could say, if we followed out the program of research and thinking in the moral landscape, are you saying that we could say what is right for them? We could actually deduce um, some moral truths that would apply to them, even if we don't know anything about their evolutionary history. Is that your claim? This comes down to the difference between answers in practice and answers in principle. So the way I illustrate this always at this point is just to say that there are many scientific questions that are trivially easy to state and have a trivially easy answer, and yet they're perpetually out of reach. In fact, we can't even imagine what would allow us to answer them. And, and okay, but the one is, here is just, just you know, uh, how many birds are in flight over the surface no, of the Earth no, no, at no, this no, moment? No, this, right? this is a little different, because what I'm saying is, does knowing, do you think that knowing the evolutionary history is essential for making statements about their morality or not? Is it just the fact that they can experience and they're rational? Oh, is yeah. that enough for you that in theory, you could derive some moral truths. Well, yeah, it's totally irrelevant in the sense that you could create a new species now that has no evolutionary history, right? You've just stamped it onto creation or create the the first conscious computer, and it would still be reasonable to ask whether that thing, that conscious system, was suffering, and if so, how much, or or, or it's happy. Granted, suffering is one dimension, but I raise it to, so, but what would you say about rights? I think it's something you don't talk a lot about in the moral landscape, if I remember. The, so think about it this way, and I think Darwin actually even speculated on this, about if, if, so suppose we find life on another planet, and suppose we find that it reproduces sexually as we do uh, as individuals, um, but then we find a different planet where it seems similar, except that they reproduce clonally. So each individual is an exact copy of the other ones within its community or its nation or whatever it is. Um, And I would submit to you that if we know that one species reproduces clonally, um, we can predict that they would not have notions of individual rights like Mm. the one that reproduces sexually. And I don't think that we can say that the one that reproduces, well, they're wrong. They, they need to get notions of individual rights. They, they shouldn't be treating the people like that. So uh, my point is that mm. there are anthropocentric truths, and they emerge from the kind of species that it is. And so what is morally true for a species that reproduces clonally by direct, you know, copying with exactly the same genome, sort of like the Borg on Star well, not the, well, the Borg's different, but w- w- n- you, that... Um, facts about the origin, facts about the psy- can tell you facts about the psychology, facts about the psychology can tell you whether certain whole categories of, of moral truths such as rights are relevant or not. Again, this comes down to the different projects in science, one being descriptive and one being normative. And, and so descriptively, yes, knowing a creature's evolutionary history will tell you a lot about what it's likely to want, what it's likely to find to be a source of suffering, what it's likely to think is morally salient in the sense that what is relevant in regulating its its social attitudes and, and behavior with other creatures in its environment and conspecific. So it's, it's, you know, morality emerges in once you have more than one sentient being, you know, so if you're, if you're alone on an island, I don't think morality is, is, is a problem, but well-being is still a problem. So, so our moral concerns are a subset of a, a deeper concern about well-being. And, and well, that's the def, that's your definition. Yes. You're on your definition. That's right. Everything's consistent and we have different definitions of morality. Perhaps we, we should go there. I, th- I think it's, I don't know if I fully answered your question. I think I think the history is actually irrelevant moving forward toward answering the question of what will maximize the possible well-being of you and those around you given what you are. 
we have to leave the monkey behind, in, in our case, in so many ways. We have to get rid of tribal violence, we have to get rid of our disgust circuitry that misfires in, in all co sorts of ways, that, that leading us to condemn people for things that shouldn't be considered moral infractions. We have an understandable set point emotionally and, and physiologically on various topics based on evolution, but we're in the process of rejecting many of those levels. And that's a... Yep. Um, morality evolves and, and, culturally. And, and, and yeah, and, and morality consists in our finding our way through that maze toward a circumstance where more and more people flourish. Right. So, I mean, so well, that, that, that's your that's your conception of morality, and that's all coherent and consistent. Tell me how it's not yours. So, if I told you there's one way you can live that's going to get you everything you want in life, but it's going to come at a massive cost to some little girl somewhere who's going to be made miserable by it, or there's another way you can live that's just as good as the first. You're going to get everything you want in life. That, but that's fine. I that agree with you. The, but the little girl's also going to flourish. So you're you're committed to more general flourishing as well. Right. No, as I said, ceteris paribus, more flourishing is better than less. It's yeah. just a question of whether this is all there is, is the is the experiences, and we add up the experiences. Uh, you know, and as I said in one of my replies to you, um, you know, what the view you're taking is kind of like Dan Kahneman's early work on happiness, where he thought that um, you just you add up the total moments of happiness, and whatever life has more more of those moments is the better one. But he changed his mind, and one of the reasons is because while our experience of suffering and flourishing is important, there are other elements, and a big part of it is the story we tell about ourselves, our sense of meaning. Mm. It isn't just the total number of moments. And I, I always do this with my my students. I ask them, which life would you rather have? One in which the total, you know, and I draw out graphs. One in which the total amount of happy moments or pleasure is, you know, 50% more over the life, which is huge. But, you know, in the last 10 or 20 years, y the story you have about your life is that you were an utter failure. Um, and um, so it's it, our sense of meaning, our sense of narrative, there's more to a happy life than moments of flourishing. And this is why I don't think you could measure with, with an fMRI scan or any other tool. You can't just measure the amount of happiness or pleasure add it up and say, this life is better than that. Actually, that's a good point, because I argued with Danny Kahneman about this over a dinner. Unfortunately, this wasn't public. This was just private argument. But it was a very interesting conversation, because I pressed him on, on precisely this point. The terminology he was using at that point was the experienced self and the remembered self. Yeah, right. right. And so the remembered self is this retrospective look. So you, when you, when you, if you were just going to sample someone's experience moment by moment, and, and you stick in your well-being detector, and just see how happy they were, that would be the experienced self, moment by moment. But the remembered self is when you ask them, you know, how good is your life? How happy are you? How actualized are you? You know, what, what, how do you feel about your future? Then you get these these broader answers that, you know, summarize the last year of their life or so. Right, but I'm and, talking about something even beyond that, because even that is still just about happiness. How much happiness do you remember that you had? I'm saying there are levels of meaning, a yes. sense of purpose, a sense of accomplishment. There's sure, things beyond sure. just how much happiness you remember. Right, sure. And, and we can bundle all of that into this remembered self, right? Or, or is, 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 uh, is, remembered self is the only one you can talk to. His point is that whenever you ask someone how happy you are, they are always giving you the remembered self's version of it. And so when you talk to people, they talk about, again, and I, I fully agree, they talk about more than just moment-to-moment -moment pleasure. They're, they're not aspiring to be successful heroin addicts. They want more out of life. They want a sense of meaning. They want connections. They want a story yeah, that they can tell about themselves. All, all of things, it, yeah. right? And some of those things that they achieve come at the expense of an obvious diminishment in moment-to-moment -moment pleasure, right? So p people go through ordeals to get through, you get to what they, this, this thing that they think that they want. That makes a good story. So I still think the area under the curve is the final answer here. It's just that you have to be clear about what's under the curve. So Okay. The, okay. Hey, can, I, can I suggest, actually, given that we're, we're going to run out of time, I have office hours coming up, and I think uh, the campus political correctness and political correctness in general is something you and I care a lot about, and I think yeah. uh, I saw on Twitter a lot of, the listen, a lot of uh, your, your listeners were asked that we talk about it, so I'm just going to suggest that, given that we're running out of time, we move on to that. Okay, well, uh, let's table that. But I, I would just say to you that there's more than what you or Danny have said on that topic, and we can talk about it at some other point. So what the hell is going on politically? And you've pointed this out in, in many different ways in the past. There, there's a level of, there, there are different blind spots on the left and right politically and morally. And the conversation between the two, or, or lack thereof, plays out in really bewildering ways at this point. So give me your thinking at the moment on this 
topic. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I've been extremely alarmed uh, by the way campus culture at, at, at a lot of our, our top schools has changed radically just in the last two years. There's, there's, there are these new ideas about safety, and I hear undergraduates often saying things like, they just take it for granted that a classroom is supposed to be a safe space. Now, if they mean you know, that the teacher shouldn't insult people or people shouldn't you know, hit each other, of course, but what they mean is that people should not be exposed to ideas that might make them feel marginalized or demeaned. For example, if somebody were to question um, affirmative action that could be threatening to students who might have benefited from affirmative action. Therefore, you can't question it. And it's very strange that um, um, people are getting in trouble. And I, I was dragged before the Equal Opportunity Commission for showing a video that in class that one student objected to one word that a student said in it. All this really? weird, yeah, what, weird. What, what weird, was the word? Disgusting. So it was. Um, it was in the context of a discussion about the dumbfounding scenario, actually. Um, and it was a conversation between two UVA undergraduates. And one of them uh, is, uh, you know, he's, he's cross-examining the other one. The experimenter cross-examines the other one. And the guy ultimately says, well, I don't know. I can't explain why it's wrong. Well, you know, I guess I just, you know, I have a sister myself. And I just, I would just find it disgusting to watch, you know, to think about having sex with her. Mm. So the experimenter follows the script, which is, because people often say something like that. And so the experimenter says, well, I, you know, okay, you'd find it disgusting, but does that make it wrong? I mean, personally, you know, like if I were to see two men having sex, like I personally would find that disgusting. I wouldn't want to mm. watch it. But, you know, that doesn't make it wrong. I mean, if people are inclined that way, they have every right to do it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, right. So, okay, so, you know, I, I've shown this video 50 times. Um, but by the time class was over, a student had emailed the dean to complain about my homophobia. Um, I thought she must have just missed the part. She must have misunderstood the video. I mean, I said, well, come talk to me tomorrow. Let's, let's look at the video. You'll see. He's not condemning homosexuality. He's actually pro-gay rights. Um, but, it, you know, she engineered it. Basically, she brought the class to a standstill. She demanded that I apologize. And finally, I, you know, she bullied me into apologizing. And finally, I did uh, just because I had to keep the class going. And this was because it was an intensive class every day for a week. Hmm. Um, so I apologized, but she didn't like the apology. So she brought me in front of the Equal Opportunity Commission, which then there was no way that they were going to convict me. I and mean, it, this is at UVA? No, this is at NYU. Um, and, uh, but the point is, it, to it, it took like about a month out of my life. And during that time, she uh, mounted a social media, or she had other people mount a social media campaign, writing things about how homophobic I am. So it was a really a nightmare. Mm. And I was so like, what the hell is going on? Like, where is it? You know, it just didn't make any sense. I mean, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I've been parts of groups uh, uh, pushing for gay rights. My research is on disgust. Actually, I have a paper that, uh, showing how you can reduce prejudice against gay people. So I felt like, what, you know? My intentions are, are, are all in the right place. I didn't say anything. What's, what's going on? Um, and then other things similar to that happened to me and then began happening to, to lots of other people. And this is in the 2013 to 2014 academic years when this all begins to happen. The campus is invitations, the words trigger warning and safe space, they barely exist before 2012. But by 2014, they're everywhere. Um, and this is why when Greg Lukianoff, who is the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, when he came to me in the summer of 2014 with his diagnosis that, you know, John, this weirdness going on on campus, it's exactly the, the errors that I learned about in cognitive therapy. Like, campus is teaching undergraduates to think in the exact distorted ways that cognitive therapy teaches you not to do, like catastrophizing, mm. mind reading, all, you know, all those sorts of things. And so I was so busy. I was saying no to everything. But when Greg came to me after my own experiences, I said, oh, my God, Greg, this is brilliant. This is, ex this is what's going on. So that's what led to he and I writing this article that was published in The Atlantic last August. And it was, you know, and we had no idea campuses were going to melt down beginning at Halloween at Yale, Missouri, uh, so many other schools. So a very strange thing is happening. And I think it's so interesting. I mean, it's horrible because it basically has put a chill on free speech. Everyone is afraid of saying anything that will set off the most sensitive student in the class. Every, you know, professors all over the country are scrubbing their syllabi clean. Mm. We're not showing videos that could provoke. We're not saying things. So education is taking a nosedive in this country because everyone's afraid of, of you know, a big social media storm or being charged with, with uh, marginalizing or whatever it is. So this is what's happening. Um, and, and this is purely a liberal phenomenon, right? Is, is there a conservative analog to this, or is this just... A little bit, yeah. So what happens, so, so there's a wonderful paper on the origin of microaggressions. In fact, if, if uh, listeners just Google where, uh, where microaggressions really come from, I wrote a summary of this article. And what these authors, uh, Manning and Campbell, 
to sociologists. What they point out is that microaggressions, the idea of these, you know, the idea that, like, if I ask an Asian student, where are you from? That's a microaggression because I'm implying that he or she is not American. The idea that this is an act of aggression is an odd idea, but the whole culture of microaggressions, they point out, only emerges in places that are very, very egalitarian, meaning, so that would be on the left, but, and also that have administrative bodies that will punish um, opponents. So it's the very presence of all the diversity committees, all the ways you can punish people for saying things you don't like. This is why the most progressive places in America, like Yale, Amherst, Brown, the, stu the schools that were erupting in riots are the most progressive left-leaning places. Mm. And it's because the whole idea of seeing everything as a microaggression only flourishes in those places. But to answer your question, once you get this dialogue of, I've been traumatized, I've been offended against you've uh, you know you've committed violence against me. Once you get people on the left saying that about everything, the few people on the right and there's you know there's often a minority. I mean, there are some conservatives at Yale, Brown, and Amherst. They then start using that language too. So you do see occasional examples of people on the right claiming that they've been traumatized or microaggressed. But mm -hmm. it is mostly a left. It's it's mostly it mostly comes from the social justice left. This is a recent phenomenon, but this seems to be of a piece with something that isn't so recent. So like, for instance, the these no-go areas in science, these taboo topics like racial and gender differences in intelligence, you know, the bell curve wars and, you know, Larry Summers getting into hot water at Harvard. And I think I actually, you, you wrote about this some years ago in, in an edge piece, you speculated that mapping the genome is going to open up a much larger front in this war of controversial topics. So, I mean, have you thought any more about that? I, I can imagine that, that th this is only making it that much more difficult to touch any of these areas scientifically if you know you're going to get, you can't even talk about them in front of your classroom. That's right. So, so political correctness is not new. Um, even back in the 60s, there were all kinds of things you could not say. There was a big wave of it in the 19, in early 1990s and hate speech codes, all that sort of stuff. What's new um, is the idea that students or people, but especially students, are so fragile that if they're exposed to something um, that is an offensive idea, they will be traumatized, they will be damaged. And that wasn't there in the 90s. In the 90s, the idea was this is an incredible injustice, you're a bad person for saying this, you're a bad person for studying this. But there wasn't the idea that, oh, you've, 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 traumatized people, you've damaged people. So that's new, the idea of fragility. And this grows out, I've learned a lot since uh, Lukianoff and I wrote the Atlantic article. Um, this ultimately seems to grow out of the massive changes in child rearing that happened in the United States after the early 1980s. So um, if you were born before about 1975, uh, then you had a childhood like people all over the world have always had, which is that you spent a lot of time without adult supervision. Mm. And sometimes, sometimes you got in fights, sometimes you got lost, sometimes you got scared. Uh, and you'd figure it out yourself. But we had a real crime wave um, beginning in the 70s, and there were several high-profile abductions, especially Aton Pates, three blocks south of where I'm sitting right now in Greenwich. Yeah. Um, and right around the time of Aton Pates, just after that, we get cable TV. And once we get cable TV, we have constant 24-hour coverage of every child abduction. So even though pretty much nobody abducts children other than the non-custodial parent, Americans came to fear that if they ever had kids unsupervised, those kids would be abducted. It is literally illegal to let your eight-year-old walk to a park two blocks away. You can be arrested for mm. doing that. So parents don't do that. Kids are never without adult supervision until they're you know, mid-teens in many cases. And so what happens is students get to college and they have not, um, they have not had a chance to really deal with setbacks and, uh, and even insults on their own. There's always been some authority that they should appeal to. So they get to college and somebody says something. Maybe somebody criticizes affirmative action and that hurts. They don't like it. So what do they do? Um, they have a they they have this uh, whole ideology built for them. They might even have encountered it before college that says that they are a victim of microaggression. Somebody, perhaps a professor, although professors are always on the left, so they might not have been it's probably more a student. Most of the complaints are actually about students. So some student said something and it hurts, and so you don't say something back. You go straight to the dean mm. or the you know the diversity administrator. You file charges. So this is what's new. This this didn't happen 10 or 15 years ago. This is just the last couple of years. Uh, they call it accountability. They they say we need to hold professors accountable for what they say. But when when everybody in the class is holding the professor accountable for not making them feel bad. I mean, it's like being back in, you know, communist Romania or East Germany. Mm. You're speaking to the Politburo, and if you say anything out of line, you know, you're in big trouble. What explains the fact that the adults are caving into this? You've just explained why the kids are coming in like this, but why does the administration 
yield to this pressure? Uh, because they have painted themselves into a corner. So two things that two things that have happened. One, um, it has been rising political polarization in the country. Um, left and right really, really dislike each other more now than they did 20 years ago. So everybody's more politicized, and the the administrators and the professors are almost all on the left now. Um, they used to only be about 70 or 80 percent on the left, or whatever. It's, it used to be two to one left to right. Now it's about five to, between five and ten to one left to right. So you have everybody's increasingly polarized. Everybody's on board with fighting conservatives. Conservatives are bad. Um, there's a kind of a new religion. In fact, linking back to everything mm -hmm. we talked about before. Four, our religious minds have created a new religion of social justice. On campus, the religion is social justice. The most sacred thing in the world is the victim, especially the African-American victim. We have blasphemy laws. If someone questions affirmative action, that's blasphemy. It is literally defined as a microaggression to question affirmative action. Uh, 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 Eric Posner, son of um, Richard Posner, mm. uh, associated questioning affirmative action with Holocaust denial. So there are blasphemy laws now. Um, so it's become a religion. And, and so once there, this religion of social justice has taken root in the humanities and increasingly the social sciences, um, now the presidents of the universities faced with demands from students um, cannot say no. They cannot say, uh, you know, in fact, maybe you do need to toughen up. Maybe you just need to, you know, yeah, sometimes students are going to say things to you. Maybe some of them are even racist, but you know, we can't have uh, uh, um, a, you know, a committee prosecuting every time someone says something offensive. They mm -hmm. can't say that. So what they have to do is they have to say, you're right. As the president of Yale said, we have failed you. So the students give him an ultimatum. They say, President Salovey, we demand that you do these things. You must respond by Wednesday. Now, if you're the president of the university, what should you do? Should you respond by Wednesday? But he has to, or rather, I shouldn't say he has to. He chose to. And so all over the country, presidents are caving, they're giving in, they're validating this victim narrative, um, and they're promising to do things like more microaggression training, more diversity training, which are going to make things worse. I've been reviewing the literature on this. Diversity training, especially if it's done in a vindictive way, backfires. So mm. it's a disaster. What's going on on campus is a disaster. I'm not on a campus, so I, I really just have to ask people like you, but, but my perception of this problem, just reading articles like your own and, and seeing people push back against it, as you are doing here and as you did in your article, I guess I've been too sanguine about this. My, my sense was that this, this problem must be, if not on the verge, it's, at least it's, it's on the, in the process of being pushed back, right? You, know, you, you seem to be saying that it's going to get a lot worse. What people don't understand, if you're not on a college campus now, if you graduated before 2013, you have no idea what's going on, because this only emerged in 2013, 2014 at a few places, and then it spread. Now, it, last fall is when it spread. So we're now living in a world of social media where ideas can spread so fast that would have taken years before. Um, so if you graduated before 2013, you, you haven't seen this stuff. It kind of has the character of, of what we often call a moral panic. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. It's a moral panic, but it, it only makes sense given the new religion of social justice. Social justice has become the religion of the humanities and parts of the social sciences, not the natural science. The natural sciences still work like real sciences. Right. I've been noticing the problems in liberalism of late, and I've, I've, I've called myself a liberal for as long as I've had any political identity at all. And it, you know, I, I reliably align with liberal principles on, you know, I check almost every box, except once we start talking about things like the clash of civilizations and the problem with political Islam. And, and then, then all of a sudden I sound, or at least I'm attacked as something more like a conservative on those topics. But I don't even know why I still call myself a liberal, given how endemic this confusion is in liberalism. And, and there's something, I, you don't call yourself a liberal anymore. You're, you're a centrist, right? That's right. But, there, but there's two things going on. Uh, so America screwed up the word liberal. We, we have no idea what it means. Um, so liberal, if, if just read John Stuart Mill, uh, classical ideas about creating space in which individuals can be free to pursue their life projects. You can't tell me what to do. I can't tell you what to do unless you're hurting me. And here we don't mean hurting my feelings in an indirect way. You know, unless you're interfering 
interfering with my life project or hurting me, you can't tell me what to do. So that's liberal. In that sense, you're liberal, I'm liberal, almost everybody on campus is is liberal, uh, most conservatives are liberal. Yeah, well, libertarians answer to that description, yeah. So so that's the, the word liberal. And in Europe, that's still what more what it means. We in America began equating liberal with left, and that's a mistake. So I was always on the left, and I think you're saying that you were and are still on the left. As a result of writing The Righteous Mind, I have moved to the center. I'm no longer on the left. I've never voted for Republican, uh, and boy, it's not looking like I'm going to this year either, um, but I'm no longer on the left. But what's really going on, I think you put your finger on it, is illiberalism. So the the uh, everybody, all the faculty are, they call themselves liberal, they're on the left, but there's a huge difference between the illiberal left and the liberal left. The illiberal left is saying, you can't use that word, you have to use this word. You can't wear that clothing, that's cultural appropriation. You must do this. We get to say, we get to dictate how everybody lives on campus. That is what is happening. And this is emerging not from the faculty on the left, this is emerging from the students, the illiberal left. It's, it's a small group, it's not most of the students. But the liberal left is afraid to stand up to them because if you stand up to them, you're racist, you're sexist. So all over, you know, on many campuses, I hear this from so many students and faculty, you know, somebody will say something outrageous. Many people in the room think, oh my God, that's crazy. But nobody has the guts to stand up because they're afraid of being called racist. But look, any virtue carried to extreme becomes a vice. So egalitarianism carried to extreme, as happened under Mao, says, you know, the people, there's the good class and the bad class, is what Mao said. Um, If you're poor, if you're a peasant, you're the good class. If you owned a business, if you're wealthy, you're the bad class. Basically, what we see on campus now with the ideology of privilege, they're the good people and the bad people. The bad people are those who are privileged, which is all white people, all men, etc., etc. So there is a rabid egalitarianism that I think has become bad. Hmm. But the other thing, and this is what's new just recently, um, is the inclusiveness. So inclusiveness is a good thing. Uh, we, we do need to take affirmative steps to make sure we're not inadvertently marginalizing or alienating African Americans, uh, uh, Latin Americans. So, you know, so inclusivity is a good thing, but carried to extreme, it becomes bad. And what's happened is this in this new religion of social justice, um, the the central virtues are inclusivity and equality. And if anyone in the seven marginalized groups feels excluded, that trumps everything else. And this is where it becomes bad, and this is where it becomes impossible to have a university, Mm. because now we can't, you know, I can't say something, I can't present a scientific theory, I can't present, you know, if we're going to talk about why are women underrepresented in the STEM fields, and if a professor were to say, well, actually, you know, prenatal testosterone actually influences what children enjoy doing, might that be relevant? You can't say that. I mean, I just said it, but but a professor on the left can't say that. So you, you literally, if you if you were teaching that subject area, you would feel that you actually had to drop that fact from the lecture. Me personally, um, I would be I would be very hesitant to say that at NYU. Not that NYU is particularly bad, but because that's where they could file charges against me. But if I'm not at NYU, I'm free to say it because students at other schools can't really do much to me. But yes, students, uh, I've heard from many professors, they are simply avoiding controversy because it's just not worth the trouble. It can take months of your life. That's incredible. I mean, but again, the, the yeah. point is that if you once you make inclusion a sacred value, that means no trade-offs. That means uh, the, the, you know, there are seven marginalized groups. So it's African-Americans, women, and gay people, LGBTQ. That's the three big ones. Mm. Then there's... Um, l- l- Latinos, um, uh, Native Americans, uh, 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 disabled or mentally ill. So those are, th- and that's that's six. That's where we were for the last ten or twenty years. But just in the last year, now it's Muslims. Muslims are the seventh. Mm-hmm. So if you say anything that uh, criticizes Islam or that would any way make Muslim students feel uncomfortable, that's that's like that's racism. That's homophobia. So st- uh, I, so professors are going to be very very careful. Here from here on in about saying anything critical of Islam. Interesting. Well, I guess I can claim to have done my part on that. <laughs> yeah, good thing you're not a professor. Yes. Uh, so what do you make of our current political landscape? What's the, the now, now we are talking at the beginning of March, and Donald Trump seems to be 
virtually guaranteed to be the Republican candidate, and it seems probably it's also going to be Clinton against him. What, what, how do you view our future? Um, well, I'm extremely alarmed um, because uh, you know I've been tracking the rising polarization for a long time, and it's been growing steadily since the 90s, the degree to which we dislike the other side. But we are at an inflection point this year. So even if, it, you know, at one point people thought, well, what if it's Trump versus Sanders? Um, even if it's going to be Trump versus Clinton, well, each side, so people on the left are you know, will, uh, are much more um, incredulous about the right that they could have nominated Trump. Um, people on the right are absolutely incredulous that people on the left could have considered nominating a socialist to run the country. Um, so I'm extremely alarmed, not just by um, by the things that that Trump says, uh, by the, the the belligerence, the the risks that I think he'll expose our country to. Um, and also, let me say, you know, while I, I think Hillary Clinton is the, you know, can, can do the job and I probably will end up voting for her because I don't see any alternative, um, I don't like a lot of what she stands for. And she is actually going to be really bad on free speech issues. Mm, she is going to double yeah. down on the idea that there's a rape culture, um, which is, it, there's not, you know, this is a whole other story, but it, it, there's a hookup culture. And uh, because of concept creep, we define everything down. Um, but Hillary Clinton is going to make it even harder to have free speech on campus because she's going to even toughen the laws on what counts as, as harassment and, and marginalization, all that stuff. Um, so I'm very upset about our choices, but I'm really concerned about our country because the degree to which we um, dislike and distrust the other side, we've already it's already made it very hard to have compromise. And, and uh, Congress, uh, many of them feel if they compromise, they'll really you know they'll really get in trouble from uh, from their uh, from their district. They'll get primaried. Um, it's going to get three times worse now. Um, so I'm very alarmed for the state of our democracy. Hmm. Yeah, I, I ran a poll on Twitter, which alarmed me. Obviously, it's just a a poll of my audience and and random people who happen to get forwarded it. So it's not not the general population, and it definitely skews liberal. But what it suggested to me is that there are many Sanders supporters who hate Clinton so much and who and whose basic platform is just rejecting traditional politics that that some significant number of them either will not vote or will vote for Trump. I don't think that's true. If you go back to 2008, um, I was one of those people. Um, I really liked Barack Obama, and I really disliked Clinton. And I thought for a while, ah, if Clinton gets the nomination, you know, I, I, I would vote for McCain. Uh, and that's the way a lot of people felt back then. But, you know, once once the election comes around. So um, there's that Arab, the Bedouin proverb, me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me, my brother and cousin against the stranger. But almost all of them, um, if it's Clinton versus Trump, almost all of them are going to vote for Clinton. That's my prediction. Yeah, well, I, I hope so, because it looks like it's going that direction. And I think uh, I have all of your reservations, I'm sure, about Clinton, but at least she seems like a grown up who can do the job and not run civilization off a cliff. That's right. So... Fingers crossed, John. Uh, well, we do live in interesting times, and uh, you and I are studying the central core of what makes things so interesting, I suppose. Yeah, well, listen, it's a pleasure to uh, have you on the podcast. I'm very glad we got a chance to talk and break our uncomfortable silence. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I really appreciate this. I really appreciate you reaching out and inviting me on. Thank you. So I look forward to seeing you at a future conference. Yeah. Until next time.